Hey guys, this video is going to be about the CNC conversion for the TAG mill. This can be applied to other mills, but I'll, I'm going to talk specifically about the conversion that I did to the TAG. Uh, the TAG is particularly good at this conversion because it's very easy to, to attach stepper motors in place of the hand cranks. You may find this challenging with other mills, but um, this is uh, yeah, I found it pretty easy with, it, with the TAG. There will be lots of information and links in the description below, so make sure you check that out. I'm not going to make this, um, I'm not going to cover things that are already well documented. I'll just like to uh, make a video that bridges all the gaps and brings everything together. Uh, since I did all this work already, I'll share it with you guys so that you can also have a CNC in your garage or perhaps spare bedroom or right in your living room just like John Saunders did in New York City at one point. So starting from the outside, we have the enclosure. This is nothing more than a storage shelf I bought at Costco. And I just reconfigured the uh, the shelf so that it would hold the mill. I have an extra three quarter inch piece of plywood supporting the the level that has the tag on there. There is a very shallow shelf with the all the electronics. So the power supply, the controller, the computer, I have the, the mouse there, and just a couple small tools on the right. But this worked out really well. Uh, it looks very good um, compared to uh, considering how much effort and cost went into this and it's very effective. The white material that you see here on the on the door and on the sides of the shelf is called Coroplast. It's a, um, it's a corrugated plastic. It's constructed exactly like corrugated cardboard uh, except it's plastic so it's um, it's much sturdier and it's um, It'll hold up to, it won't absorb oil basically, so uh, if you had some a little bit of coolant or whatever in here then that would be okay, but this is not really set up for flood coolant, um, but it does a really good job. The door is made out of um, some aluminum that I got at the local hardware store. I think it was I got it at Lowe's. Let me take it off and I'll show you how I constructed it. So this is the inside of the door that you don't normally see. Uh, it is uh, aluminum that's brazed together. There's some sticks. Uh, I forget what, the, what they're called, but I'll put, I'll put them in the description below. Um, you can braze aluminum together with just a propane torch, and there's a piece of Lexan in the middle and Coroplast on the sides. On the inside, I've got some LED lighting that's just stuck to the top of the shelf and uh, makes it look pretty nice. Okay, for st stepper motor selection, I'll put a link to the stepper motors that I selected. Uh, these are not the biggest ones you can get on here, but um, I read some some things about uh, how the bigger ones have more inertia so they can't turn around as quickly for faster op for some fast operations. And um, even though a lot of people said th these were gonna be way undersized, that I've had no problems with these at all. Um, you also wanna look at how much power, how, how much current your driver can supply and uh, size your motor accordingly and so, so given the options that I had between the different controllers um, these were I, pretty much ideal um, if I were to do it again I would I would do exactly the same thing um, I would consider maybe going up one size um, but within uh, unless I had a much more power, powerful uh, driver I think I would stay with these same stepper motors one small tip here is for the wiring there is this neat heat shrink that you can get. It has solder on the inside. So you put just your sticky wires in there and you hit it with a heat gun until you first, well first you'll see the heat shrink um, activate and, and suck down and then you keep applying heat and there's a band of solder with flux in there and it will it'll melt and it will um, make a really good electrical connection. And this is really important. You want to use a good gauge, um, proper gauge wire and you want to um, run it pretty close to the motor. Uh, the You don't want to go with a small wire because you are actually moving a fair amount of current for a very long amount of time. Sometimes uh, there's uh, times I've run this for six to eight hours nonstop on a, on a long operation and the wires will get very hot and I have um, on these kinds of connectors I've had problems with them melting. Um, not all the way through melting but they have softened and they've actually stuck together and um, yeah don't, don't go with a poor mechanical connection, get, get a really good mechanical connection and make sure you're not using tooth and a wire. So over here you can see the coolant setup. It's just two uh, lock line hoses that let you position to these two nozzles to um, supply high pressure air to the cutter and it does a great job of evacuating chips. 
Um, I have not found that I needed anything more than this. Um, if I were to do it again, um, I would maybe consider MQL, but uh, I would not go with the flood coolant route at all. For the, the size of chips and the, the cutting speed of a smaller mill like this, uh, the most important thing is chip evacuation. If you can't get the chips out of the pocket that you're working in, then you're, it's going to be a disaster. Um, these two are mounted to the T-nut slots on the spindle. Um, the little Y adapter and the T-nuts the themselves are 3D printed. Those will be in a file in the description below. Then you've got a quarter inch line, airline coming out of there. And there is the air valve and solenoid right here. This is um, a 24 volt solenoid. And this basically uh, turns your air on and off automatically. Um, the, uh, the controller will have an output for this. And through, through a relay, it'll turn 24 volts on and off here. So down in there, you won't be able to, be able to see it very well, but uh, I'm currently using a tiny G, and previously I was using this guy, the gerbil controller. Um, I'll talk about first the gerbil controller. Um, it works pretty well. Um, I, I found one limitation to it. Um, otherwise, this is actually all you really need. Um, I put these giant heat sinks on the drivers, which you should try to do. There's uh, a thermal epoxy that I used. I'll look in the description below for that one. And um, you want to keep the drivers cool because they they do have thermal overload protection. So you won't burn them up, but they'll just stop moving your drivers, and then uh, that's not very fun. Um, so the it comes with the uh, generally comes with the I think the Allegro. Uh, like 44 90, 98 or something like that. Those are okay. Um, I found these the, these TI ones to be a little bit, a little bit better, and they're more robust. They are not as as quiet, but um, the motion was just as smooth. So the problem I had with this uh, was that the uh, the connectors for the for the stepper motors. Let me see if I can focus better. There we go. So the connectors are these little pins right there. And the way you connect them is with these little guys. And so the problem that I had with these is that um, the actual ends, uh, there's very little metal um, that, that's uh, all the current's flowing through. So after a maybe five or six or maybe even an eight hour, um, eight hour operation, these would get really hot and the plastic would basically melt a little bit. It would soften and they would kind of get stuck together and that was really concerning. Um, I knew that it, that um, that was a sign that there was a, um, you're losing current flow through there because you're generating all this heat in the small area. So that was the primary reason I upgraded from the dribble. If you're not doing really long operations where you require a lot of power, then um, you could probably get away with this. This was a really nice controller. The one I use now is the Tiny G, and it's in there, and it uses uh, screw terminals instead of these guys. And so that is a, a much better solution. Uh, the motion, I, I do notice the motion's smoother, um, but the resultant cut in the tool load at the speeds that I'm cutting at um, is not a very big difference. Uh, this, this controller does cost a, a little bit more, and let's see if I can actually get in there. So, there we go. So that is uh, the dribble controller. I've got it on its own power supply. It's not powered through USB only. I've got a little computer fan blowing across all the heat sinks. So the, I use a, a thermal, an infrared gun just to check the temperature on the, um, on the heat sinks and they stay right about 70 or 80 degrees. So that's, that's uh, working quite well. I think, uh, they can run a lot hotter, but they, um, I, I want a lot of headroom um, as far as thermal overload goes. There's a little tiny relay board I found here. Um, it's a little tricky to set up, but um, that switches the spindle on and off. And then uh, it also switches the, the second relay, switches the coolant on and off. And if you don't know about relays, then you got to learn a little bit. Because um, you will need them. The interface is called Chili Pepper. Um, you can see that it runs in a web browser, and it's just chilipepper.com slash tinyg. Uh, watch out for the spelling. I'll put a link in the description below just to make sure you get to the right site. Um, but this is a really slick interface. This is um, very intuitive and easy to use. If you've got a, a G-code file, let's take 
this one on my file server, which is not connecting. There we go. Um, let's look at this one. This is a facing operation. So you just take your G code file, drag and drop it in there, and there you go. It visualizes it for you, and you can you can pan around and kind of look at where the cutter's supposed to be. Um, so in order for the web browser to connect to the um, the Tiny G or the Dribble controller, you'll have to use this little thing called a uh, serial port JSON server. So you run this little thing that runs in a DOS box, and it should tell you, "Hey, I found this COM port." And what it does is it lets your web browser talk to your uh, USB COM port, which is emulating a, a serial port. You'll select it over here, and then you'll have a, a, a tiny G that's connected to Chili Pepper. But you, you need to configure it because you have to tell it um, how many steps for revolution, um, what kind of acceleration profiles you want to use, and uh, how big your work envelope is. So I'll, I'll post my um, my configuration. And so every time you start it up, it, for the Tiny G, it will actually send the configuration to the Tiny G since it has no uh, flash memory on board. Um, for the uh, Dribble controller, it has flash memory, so it actually saves it to there. Uh, for the Dribble, you'll actually use uh, chilipepper.com slash Dribble. So on a typical op operation, I'll show you what I do. I, I drag and drop the file just like, just like so. I will um, move the spindle over to, let's, let's just say X. We'll say go to zero, go to work zero, and then on Y we'll say go to work zero on the Y axis. And then um, this, uh, the way I, I typically set it up is the, um, the corner on the fixed jaw of the vise is uh, always zero. Um, that makes it really easy, so my XY doesn't actually move between different operations, different parts. Uh, so I don't have to re-zero the, the mill very often. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll use a piece of paper to set the Z height on my part. So you, um, you, you can find other videos of how to do this, but basically you get the, you install your tool, make sure it's tight, um, get it really close to the part, and then put a piece of paper between the tool and the part, and set your increment to one thou right there. You go one inch, that's too much, um, tenth of an inch, um, hundredth of an inch, and a thousandth, and you just kinda go down until you can feel the, uh, the piece of paper getting pinched. And then when you're at that point on the Z right here, you'll say um, zero out, work Z axis. Uh, there are different work coordinates and that's kind of complicated. Uh, we won't worry about the machine zero because um, we don't, I don't have uh, end stops on mine. So uh, if you did, then you could use the machine coordinates, but I, I, I didn't install those and I didn't seem to need them. It would be, be kind of nice, but um, I didn't see that uh, a huge advantage to having those. So once you have your machine zeroed, uh, you can just go over here and hit play, and it will start uh, start cutting. Um, if you have this configured correctly, it will turn on the spindle and then enable the coolant, and it'll start cutting. So uh, let's actually do this. There we go. And there's not actually a part in there right now. And it's not even actually the right tool, but you get, you get the idea. And so we'll stop this and I'll show you how to do that. So right over here there is a feed hold. We'll hit that. And it'll, it'll stop whatever uh, whatever it's doing pretty quickly. There's an e-stop that I've got wired up to the pendant, which I've made over here. So it'll stop the machine immediately, but then it'll lose its zero. Okay, so the feed hold command has uh, worked, and then you can hit resume if you want to pick up. Um, so you'd use the feed hold if you wanted to maybe um, go in there, check out the surface finish or something, and then just resume. Uh, if you want to cancel out, you hit the white button right here. And then uh, I like to come up here and hit stop. And then you can continue what you're doing. Um, you can load a new file or whatever. but. So what's neat about this is everything has a tooltip. So just over your mouse over. If you're not sure what it does, just um, let your mouse sit over it, and it'll tell you what it's gonna, what effect that button will have. If you need to put in a command, um, there's a little box right here. You can enter manual commands. There is um, I think M3 and M M3 and M5 are to turn the spindle on or off. Let's actually try it. And I found that this wireless keyboard's really handy. I'll put a link to that also. 
So M3, we'll hit enter. Yep. M5 turns that off, and then the coolant is M7, I think. And then M9, M9 to turn that off. Um, I think M8 is for like, I don't know, a different kind of coolant. Um, there, there's good uh, tables that you can look up for all the commands. I don't actually type in here very much other than this, um, and also the configuration. Okay guys, I hope you found this this information useful. Um, if I missed anything, um, uh, if you have questions, leave a comment in the description below and I'll try to stay on top of these, uh, on top of your questions. This is, uh, this is one of the best investments I've ever made and this was a lot of fun. It was a great learning experience. There is, um, it's, it's a good rabbit hole to go down and you can make cool parts. So that's great. A um, couple tips, if you're gonna do, be doing aluminum, use a two flute cutter. If you're doing steel, then use a four flute. Um, there, you have to, you'll have to figure out surface feet per minute and all that, how to, how to do that, but th that's not that bad. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a good skill to pick up and I'll, I'll continue doing videos like this. I'll do an instructional one on Fusion 360 on how to, uh, which is free. Uh, most people, a lot of people actually don't know that, but it's free. Um, it will, uh, you can, you can model some, uh, model something and then you can generate tool paths with it using the, the cam interface and it's, I uh, found it to be very intuitive and easy to use. Um, I can show you guys how to create different tool paths for aluminum, stainless, different pockets, um, really good practices. So if you guys would like that, if, uh, I don't know if there's a good resource out there already. I, I did not find one. Um, I'll do that also. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll see you guys next time.